If I were to ask you which school has the most claimed national championships in NCAA football history, who would you say? Most fans would probably mention powerhouse schools like Alabama, Notre Dame, Oklahoma, or Michigan. While these schools are some of the most storied programs in football history, these would not be the correct answer. Fans who are a little more familiar with the history of college football might say Army or Minnesota. Yet again, they would be wrong. What would you think if I said that the team with the most claimed national championships was Princeton with 28, and that second place belonged to Yale at 27? Alabama is only third place in all of this, and it's not even close. 17 championships claimed is incredible, but it is still 10 away from being second. Now these are only claimed national championships, and we'll get into what claim championships mean later. But for those of you who are chomping at the bit, saying, well the NCAA doesn't recognize all of those national championships from those schools, the NCAA actually does recognize many of these. Just go to their website, in a top 10 list of national championships, the NCAA says that Alabama is still only in second place with 15, and Yale would claim the top spot with 18. It is crazy to think that Ivy League schools have many national championships to claim in Division I college football, but the championship system in college football is crazy in and of itself. Today, we will explore the chaos that is college football and try to make sense of a very flawed championship system. Welcome to Sports Stories. College football began in 1869 with Rutgers University playing against New Jersey during a time when football resembled something closer to rugby. The game ended with Rutgers winning 6-4, but not in the way that we would know that score to be in today's game. The goal of the game was to kick field goals, which would count as winning a game. One field goal meant the first game was won, then the second game would start right away. So the 6-4 score was not two field goals and two safeties, rather they were 10 field goals scored for the whole match. And the way the ball was advanced was completely different as well. Players were not allowed to throw the ball or even carry it. The ball could be moved by kicking, swatting, or heading the ball. A far cry from the rules of today's game. That year, Princeton would go on to win the national championship. Or rather, they would claim that they had won the championship. Back then, there was still no tournament to decide a champion. However, the NCAA does recognize Princeton was the national champion that year. How could this be? That is the first major point that we'll be discussing today. Until the Associated Press began doing their polls in 1936, the NCAA has relied on retroactive national championships to decide who won. One of the more notable figures who named several national championships was college football historian Park Davis, who in 1933 listed who he believed were the best teams in every season starting in 1869. While most say he did a fine job at researching and selecting, many point out his bias for East Coast teams. From 1869 to 1901, Park Davis only selected teams from the Northeast, selecting Princeton, Yale, Harvard, Penn, Columbia, and Lafayette, which coincidentally or uncoincidentally happened to be the team that Park Davis coached in 1896. It would not be until 1902 that Park Davis would select a non-Northeast team to be the champion, which was Michigan. However, that year he also selected Yale as national champions. So not only was there a split national champion, but the split came from one man who wouldn't even narrow it down to just one. Now Park Davis isn't the only one to retroactively award national championships. Several polls are groups of people who review stats and scores from different seasons to decide a champion, but some go for a more mathematical approach. These polls were established to remove any bias, but it would still present its own problems. For example, if a team were to play terrible competition and blow out every opponent, they would be claimed national champions over a team that played tougher competition, based on margin of victory. 
This, of course, is an oversimplification, as each poll has several different sets of calculations to determine the best teams, but it does show how confusing college football polls can actually be. That was the pre-poll era. Matters simplify a little bit in 1936 when the Associated Press began their weekly poll, which collects a survey from the members of the media. The AP was widely considered as the top poll, with the USA Today Coaches Poll, which started in 1950, being a close second. This new era of college football is where matters get really interesting and convoluted. Instead of going on a team-by-team -team basis of claimed national championships, we'll look at one team that shows a wide range of behaviors in claiming championships. A little disclaimer though, I am a fan of this team, and yes, I love to brag about them. However, I feel I am pretty balanced in my evaluations of them, and I will be sharing stories both of their triumphs and their shortcomings. So please don't shut off the podcast just because I am discussing them. I just happen to have a wealth of knowledge on this team, so researching them was a bit easier. Also, just about every way a team could win a championship, this team has done. They have won it when they didn't deserve it, and they did not win when they arguably could lay claim to it. So this team is a good example of the chaos that Division I football has provided. Alright, with that disclaimer out of the way, let's look at a few of the Oklahoma Sooners championship claims. And just to prove I am a man of my word, let's look at their first championship, which I would say the Sooners shouldn't claim. A very interesting article on this subject can be found on heartlandcollegesports.com, written by Pete Mundo. The link to the article and consequently my other sources for this episode are in the show notes. Their first claimed championship came in 1950, when the Sooners went undefeated for the season, but lost their bowl game. Mundo states that since the Sooners lost their bowl game to Kentucky, they shouldn't lay claim to the championship, although the AP poll did award it to them. Now this was claimed by OU before the bowl game even began. This was not a situation unique to Oklahoma either. To further show how crazy the dark ages of the poll era were, the AP would release their final poll before the bowl games were ever played. An unofficial poll would be issued afterwards, but for whatever reason, the AP did not deem these postseason polls as necessary to selecting a champion. This would not change for the AP until the 1960s. For this reason, it is understandable why the Sooners would still claim it, but as believed by both myself and Mundo, if you don't win your bowl, you don't deserve a claim. This is not the only championship that Oklahoma claims. In fact, the NCAA recognizes the Sooners as winning 17 national championships. Don't believe it? I know I couldn't believe it. But sure enough, if OU wanted to claim a few more championships, the NCAA record books would already show their support of the decision. Why don't they claim more? Oklahoma has never publicly stated why, but there is a pattern in those six championships prior to the BCS era. They were all awarded by the AP poll in the year they played. The other polls were simply not as prestigious or were awarded retroactively. Thus OU does not recognize them. This is fairly commonplace with most programs such as Notre Dame and even a lowly football program like Duke who could claim a championship but has elected not to. However, there is a precedent to accept a championship that was not awarded by the AP poll. The California Golden Bears claimed the 1937 championship, despite there only being two polls that gave them that distinction. The Dunkel system awarded them the championship within that year, and one poll awarded them the championship retroactively a few years later. The AP gave the number one ranking to Pittsburgh in 1937. The most recent example of a team accepting the national championship retroactively was in 2016, when the American Football Coaches Association awarded Oklahoma State the 1945 National Championship. They were at that point called Oklahoma A&M. 1945 had Oklahoma State, Alabama, and Army all go undefeated and untied, with Oklahoma State and Army both claiming the championship that year, and Alabama not claiming the championship. A championship that OU did not accept in the year that it was awarded was in 1967, when the Sooners went 10-1 and and dominated the AP number 2 ranked team the Tennessee Volunteers in the Orange Bowl. The AP winner was USC, who shared the same record with the Sooners. 
Now, the Trojans did beat the Longhorns, who beat Oklahoma in a thriller later in the year, which may have been the deciding factor in the AP that year. But if the Sooners had accepted that championship, there wouldn't be much serious opposition, besides from USC Trojan fans. Now, for the record, I do believe that USC was deserving that year of the national championship after beating number one ranked UCLA and the number four ranked Indiana Hoosiers in the Rose Bowl. My point here is that there are less legitimate claim championships, not that the Sooners should claim it. Alright, before we wrap up the discussion of the poll era, it is important to note that even after the BCS era came into effect, the polls would still hold authority in some schools' eyes. USC claims the 2003 championship due to some controversy despite LSU winning the BCS. We will touch on that situation a little later. Before we get to the BCS National Championship format, an interesting situation occurred from the years of 1995 to 1997 that many people have forgotten about. Bowl games have what are called tie-ins, which dictate who plays in what bowl. Prior to 1995, the Sugar, for example, always had the SEC champion and another team of the Sugar Bowl's choice. This somewhat changed in 1995. Three bowl games, the Sugar, Fiesta, and Orange Bowl, rotated who would get to choose first from the SEC, Big 12, which was the Big 8 in 1995, and the Big East, which no longer has football and lost many of its schools in 2013. The Big 10 and the Pac-12, which at that point was called the Pac-10, were not part of the bowl alliance. The hope was to have the best possible odds of having the number one and the number two teams in the nation face off in the same bowl. Since Notre Dame is not part of a conference, they would get in as long as they were in the top 10 of the AP poll or the USA Today coaches poll. Nebraska would actually go on to win the top bowls in 1995 and 1997 against Florida and Tennessee respectively, and Florida won it in 1996 against in-state rival Florida State. This was still not without controversy, as Michigan was awarded the AP National Championship in 1997, challenging Nebraska's Bowl Alliance and Coaches Poll National Championship. At this point, everyone agreed that a change was in order. No longer was it difficult to travel across the country to play against top competition. Television allowed pollsters and executives to watch games instead of needing to read about them in the newspaper, and every major conference was on board to create a better system. No longer were polls necessary to determine who would compete for the top spot. And what was the new system that they came up with? A polling system. Well, a conglomerate of polling systems, including human and computer polls. While this did remove some controversy in selecting a champion, it did not remove all. The biggest controversy usually occurred in deciding who would be ranked number two and number three. And two notable years of this were in 2003 and 2011. The 2003 National Championship featured Oklahoma and LSU. While LSU was undoubtedly deserving of being in the game, Oklahoma somehow snuck in. Oklahoma had an incredible regular season, with Heisman Trophy winner Jason White lighting up defenses. They also had a top-tier defense, with three players being picked in the NFL Draft, most notably defensive tackle Tommy Harris, who was a first-round draft pick for Chicago, and Buckus Award winner Teddy Lehman, who was drafted in the second round by the Detroit Lions. They seemed like a shoe-in for the national championship. They, however, could not win the conference championship. They would go on to lose the Big 12 championship game to an inspired Kansas State team. They wouldn't just lose, they would get dissected in a 35-7 loss. At that point, everyone was expecting the BCS championship game to be between Pete Carroll's USC Trojans versus Nick Saban's LSU team. It would be an incredible matchup of a strong SEC defense and a high-flying Pac-10 offense that included Heisman Trophy winner Matt Leinert and future Heisman Trophy winner Reggie Bush. This dream game was what the BCS was supposed to guarantee the fans. This was not to be, however, as the Sooners had been so dominant over the course of the year that they overcame being ranked number three in the human polls, as the computers calculated that they were better than USC. The AP poll had USC at number one and LSU at number two, with Oklahoma being ranked third. The coaches also had Oklahoma at number three, but it had LSU ranked number one and USC number two. But the Sooners had magically got in. 
and the BCS selected LSU to play the Sooners. This controversy was further solidified when USC won the Rose Bowl game against a solid Michigan team by 14 points, and LSU shut down Oklahoma's high-flying offense. The BCS obviously would give the championship to LSU, but the AP left USC at the top, creating a split championship and the first example of the BCS being just another flawed system. The second example wasn't quite as strange, but was still an important factor in leading to the eventual playoff format we have today. In 2011, Alabama and LSU were neck and neck towards the top of the polls leading up to their rivalry game in Week 9. This would put them at the top of the BCS standings right into the postseason, and barring an LSU loss, seemed to knock out the Crimson Tide out of championship contention. The third team that surged to the top of the three polls was Oklahoma State, who had beaten two top 10 teams in Texas A&M and Oklahoma to win the Big 12 championship. Their only loss came at the worst possible moment, losing a heartbreaker in overtime to Iowa State towards the end of the year. That loss only dropped the Cowboys one spot, but number two was awarded to Alabama, who had maintained that ranking into the postseason. And although Alabama would not get to play in their conference championship, they received the go-ahead to get a rematch with LSU, something only Alabama fans in the SEC network wanted to see. That game would become a snore-fest 21-0 Alabama win, while the Cowboys beat Andrew Luck and the Stanford Cardinal in the Fiesta Bowl, which ended up going into overtime. Two short seasons later, the BCS was formally retired, with the college football playoff being instituted in 2014. And with that, we finally have a system where we can have no doubt as to who the national champion is. I am only kidding, of course. The current playoff format is still extremely subjective, leading to controversy almost equal to the BCS. However, it is definitely better than the system that we had before. But before we get into opinions, let's look at how this format works. A playoff selection committee of 13 selectors choose who they believe the best four teams are. These 13 selectors are rotated with new members usually every three years. They range from people such as former Virginia Tech coach Frank Beamer to Ohio State Athletic Director Gene Smith to former Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice. According to the playoff committee's website, their criteria for who the four teams that should make the playoffs include championships won, which are conference championships, strength of schedule, head-to-head -head competition, and comparative outcomes of common opponents. These are considerations only for when a tiebreaker between two similarly talented teams is needed. Of course, when categories like these are to be weighed by a human element, disagreements can arise, and these criteria may not even matter. In 2017, Alabama made the playoffs despite not playing in their conference championship game. Same thing for Ohio State the year before. Notre Dame does not play in the conference, but has made it this current year. Good arguments could be made for these three teams to make the playoffs, however. Specifically, for an independent team like Notre Dame, who went undefeated and played quality opponents, despite not having a conference championship game. It is just important to note that at this point in the playoffs, conference championships have not mattered for three of the five years that we have had this system. Now to wrap up the history of the playoffs to this point, here are a few interesting facts about the playoffs. Alabama has made it every year since the playoff format has been instituted, the only team to do so. They have won two in the last four seasons, and the 2018 playoffs are in a few short days of the release of this episode. The Heisman Trophy winner has played in all but one playoff, which was Lamar Jackson of Louisville in 2016. The Heisman winners were Jameis Winston, Marcus Mariota, Derrick Henry, who is the only Heisman Trophy winner to win the college football playoff, and Baker Mayfield. Kyler Murray, the current Heisman Trophy winner, will face Alabama at the end of the month. Only two coaches have made the playoffs every year since they became their team's head coach, Alabama's Nick Saban and Oklahoma's Lincoln Riley. Alabama and Clemson have faced each other more times than any other two teams in this format. The Tide have won two of three and could potentially meet for a fourth year in a row if both teams win their respective games. All right. Now I would like to offer my own college football playoff format. I'd love to hear your thoughts on the Facebook page and what you think should happen with the playoff. 
I think there should be a 10-team playoff. There should be as little subjectivity as humanly possible. So every conference has a championship game, and those winners should get in. Sorry, Notre Dame. you got to join a conference if you want to compete in the tournament. Once those teams have been decided, the playoff committee has the duty of seeding the teams. The top two teams, which this year have been Alabama and Clemson, get a bye week, like the NFL playoffs. The rest play in round one, and the lowest seeded teams play the top two teams of that round. And then at that point, it would just become an Elite Eight style tournament. I've heard a lot of talk about an eight team playoff, where the committee would select eight teams instead of four. While that would be better than what we have currently, the issue of subjectivity would still be a problem. I don't believe that a team like UCF would ever make the tournament in this way. The committee would simply keep them ranked at number 9 or 10. I do agree that if UCF wants to make the playoffs under this current format, they need to schedule better opponents. However, even if they beat a team like Michigan or Georgia, I would still see the argument being made that their conference is still weak, and one good win against a top 5 team would not be enough to overcome it. It is simply not a fair system where UCF has to guess at who will be a good non-conference opponent. Here's an example. Look at Alabama playing against Florida State in the season opener of 2017. It was a top three matchup with some thinking it could set up a future rematch game in the postseason. But after playing Alabama tough for that week, Florida State spiraled towards the bottom of the ACC and they almost didn't even make a bowl. Now imagine if UCF had scheduled the number three Seminoles in week one, feeling like they can answer some questions about their legitimacy, and would even go on to win the game. Then at the end of the year, Florida State barely even qualifies for the postseason. UCF would be back to square one, as the Power Five conferences would be able to show a tougher strength of schedule. My point isn't that UCF should make the playoffs this year. Under our current system, they simply don't cut it. My point is, the system needs to change. My format would place a bigger emphasis on winning the conference and would give every conference a shot at producing a champion. Because right now, college football is the only sport where a team can go undefeated for two years in a row and not be allowed to compete. Make the champion prove their worth on the field and not in a poll or in a meeting room. Alright, that is our first episode of Sports Stories. Thank you so much for listening. I hope to hear from you guys in the Facebook group. Uh, if you guys have a suggestion of a story you would like me to cover, if you guys have a, have a team you would like me to cover the history for, or a sport you want me to cover the history for, uh, just let me know. Hit me up in the comments. Don't forget to hit the like button and subscribe, and I hope you enjoyed this episode.